Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so many, uh, so great to see so many faces each week. I really appreciate you all showing up. Uh, we have Mr. A's in the house tonight. Uh, I have to tell you, I just went up there uh, to get the, to pick up the drinks for David and I, and because uh, you know we have to sample the drinks. Um, and uh, what a, what a treat it was to be up there. So beautiful. So uh, we are doing a cocktail called Lovely Day, and uh, this is on their bar menu. And we have Ryan, the bartender. Hi, Ryan. My name is Ryan from Mr. A's at Baker's Hill. And we opened last week, and we're open from Tuesday through Sunday, starting at 5.30. Soon we're rolling out a to-go menu, but to stay tuned for more of that, currently we have come up for it. Currently when you come up for dinner, you can take home a drink or two. And one of those drinks is a lovely day that I'm going to make for you. Great. And you're seating out on the patio, right? So it's totally yeah, it's the patio. So roughly about 22 tables right now. Right. Well, it's probably the best patio in the city. Yeah, not too bad. Without a doubt. So Ryan, let's see that drink. All right. So first we start with a little bit of mezcal. And then we move on to our watermelon. We add in there. And then we add a little bit of a citrus, which is lemon. Add some agave. And then some ancho reyes, which is a chili liqueur. All that, add your ice. A nice hard shake. Glass and put it in. And then we're gonna add some cucumbers to it for a little garnish. It's a lot of cucumbers. There we are. Cheers, you guys. Salute. David? Thank you. Let me say it with the microphone on this time. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. So, um, a little protocol. You know, if you've been on this, you know this already, but what we want to do is you can see the chat function at the bottom and you can ask a question via chat. And if I'm not paying attention to that, Darren will nudge me uh, via text or something to watch the questions. And we'll just try to have some questions as we go. I'll also try to reserve some time at the end. Uh, our wonderful guest has another Zoom call right an hour from now. So we will have to keep this to just a little under an hour. Um, so let's just jump in. I am thrilled to introduce the wonderful artist and good friend Patricia Reset, who many of you know. Raise your hand if you've heard Patricia sing in San Diego. Yay, many, many, many of you. So, uh, you know, Patricia's, as you all know, a world-renowned soprano. Um, sort of, I, I would say, becoming to be one of the best uh, experts, expert performers of Puccini and Janacek, particularly. Um, and her repertoire is expanding. She's continuing to sing. Her portfolio of activities is also growing. So let's just start having a conversation. And you guys will love hearing from her. So welcome, Patricia. Hi, everyone. So nice to to be here and to, I don't want to lie. Okay, now I can see you. See all of you. Um, it's, it's lovely. Let me just say on the onset how still devastated I am that I had to cancel due to being ill for your gala event. I, I really am. I was so, so looking forward to that. But anyway, it's nice to be here and to, to connect. So for those of you that were attending the gala last year, you knew this was the case. And if you 
weren't, you may have heard this story, but Patricia came, even though she was quite under the weather, um, and uh, was meant to do a show that we called Diva on Detour. And as I said that, that night, our diva's voice took a detour. So she was upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> she tried, she was very, ga the gallant effort. She came, she was upstairs at the Pendry Hotel. She rehearsed in the morning and then just had no voice. So, um, but she's been with us many times here in San Diego. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. But let's just start off at the beginning and let's talk about where you're from. Tell us about your childhood and the role that music played for you as a child. Um, I grew up in New Hampshire, just outside of Manchester and um, blue collar family and um, no real passionate connection to music per se, except my mother was crazy about Elvis. That's the only thing I can say. Um, but uh, it's something um, I, I asked to get a guitar when I was a little girl. Well, first they gave me a little toy organ when I was like four and they saw, I, I did, wasn't interested in opening any of my other Christmas presents. So they knew something was up. So eventually I asked for a guitar and they got me an accordion. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, which, which was fine, but it was not what I had in mind. So I spent a little time on the accordion and immediately demanded the guitar, got the guitar <laughs> and, um, music found its way into my life because it was, um, it was a need for expression, even as a little young person. <laughs> and, um, in fact, I used to just, I, I taught myself the guitar and would play my chords and realize this is just a little boring. So I started to sing. And again, very, very young. I would go to the Hallmark store and buy cards and I would write songs based on the sentiments of these cards. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was truly, truly a total form of expression for me and something that I attached to at a very young age. Obviously, as I got older, um, as, as an older child, as, an, as, a, as a teenager and all that, I, I, it became more formal what I was doing. I joined the choir and all that, and, and my affinity for jazz and cabaret certainly came from that experience because my choir director was particularly um, into that. So it really was something that took over my attention at a, at a very young age, and, um, but was very personal. I find in it fact, I, you know, sorry. I find it interesting that even at that age, you, you sought or you saw music as a medium to tell stories, right? So like the way that you were expressing the sentiments of the cards through music, like that's the first intention yeah. you had. I remember playing one of the songs I had written for my mother she sat there and looked at me and she said, where did you get this story? Because I'm like, you know, eight years old and I'm singing about this horrible breakup and heartache. She's like, what's going on? <laughs> and so I had to explain it. There was something, you know, it's interesting. There was something always appealing to me about sad music, something cathartic, something. And, and thank God my repertoire is such that I've been able to live an incredibly cathartic artistic and performance life through, yeah. through the roles I've done. And it just, it obviously was something that um, had a great importance for me. Um, and yeah, it just sort of, it took off from there. I remember the choir director in high school asked me, um, you, would you want to join the choir? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I sing alone, thank you. <laughs> of course I joined it. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't be bothered with that. No, uh, exactly. If so, you see me dip down, it's because my dog's attacking my feet, but anyway, well, go ahead. we should, we, if you feel like introducing your dog, feel free. I, I do. If she would just come up here, but I, I will. Uh, It'll happen. Um, so, so I, I knew you because I was a student at TCU in Fort Worth while you were a student at what was then North Texas State University. And I believe your, your wife, your partner, that yep. Clayton was at SMU, so there was a lot of singing energy in Dallas Fort Worth at that time. And I yeah. remember you singing Senza Mama in the finals of Nats um, at one year. I think it was your senior year, um, and mm -hmm. it was already fabulous. I mean, you were already meant to sing the repertoire even then. But we so North Texas State University of North Texas now, uh, mm -hmm. for those that don't know, it is a very very big and impressive. School of Opera has one, but also has a very important and prominent School of Jazz uh, music. So were you drawn there because of the jazz program or because of Entirely, opera? 
yeah. entirely. I had no interest in opera. I, I had no one knowledge of opera. I went there for the jazz program. And uh, interestingly enough, I had a Zoom call earlier today with um, the, the, the Dean uh, College of Music at UNT. So it's coming full circle. Um, no, I had, uh, I had no interest in, in fact, I was so ignorant of it. Um, I couldn't, I put myself to school so I couldn't afford to go there and audition. So I sent, this is gonna date me, a cassette tape. Um, with my selections and they were this is this is a little embarrassing but I'm hoping you'll find it charming um, George Benson's masquerade you know that was you know that was my 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 jazz tune and then I sent in hear ye Israel which is from an oratorio and per la gloria for my operatic audition by the way there was no opera there so I, I mean it was really just something I was doing as a prerequisite to get through and in fact because I was putting myself through school and because I was working 30 plus hours, um, you know, to make ends meet and everything and going to school. I missed my jazz singers audition. Oh. And, TSU. and in doing so, I couldn't try out again till the next semester. And in that semester, opera sucked me in completely. Oh. So that's, that's the story. It's truly, truly accidental that I've had this 32 year career in this. Wow. Well, <laughs> and you know, at another school, if you'd gone to another school to pursue jazz, they may not have had a very distinguished opera program and you, that wouldn't have happened, right? Right, and that's might not true. Have yeah. In all honesty, my recollection, and perhaps I'm mistaken, the, the facilities there are incredible now. I rehearsed in an old kitchen in Clifton Hall yeah. for, for the opera stuff. It wasn't as, as widespread, even though it had, a, it had a really great voice department, it was the opera department wasn't as full fleshed out as it is now. Right. So. Um, but it, I mean, obviously, it 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 did right by me, and I and, and things have worked out. But it's yeah, it's I mean, it's a huge school too, isn't it? Come yeah. here, Zoe. So um, you went from University of North Texas. Were you then pretty quickly into San Francisco Marilla Adler program? Is that what happened next? Immediately. Wow. So tell us about a that. Week and a, half, a week and a half after I graduated. I mean, oh. I. I, 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 you know, auditioned for a whole bunch of stuff. My first choice was the San Francisco Marilla program and happily I got it. Um, and in uh, like a week and a half, maybe two weeks, I was in San Francisco embarking on this career that it, it took me quite a while to figure out what was going on. I was, I was, I was very young. I was 21. Mm -hmm. I was, I was green, green, green truly not very experienced. I don't, th I, I think everything we sang in the opera department was always in English. So my first role in a foreign language was the role I sang in Marilla. And it's a small little role called Cho Cho San that I sang. And, <laughs> and so it's just, it was, it was, <laughs> it was very exciting and scary and overwhelming and all encompassing really a, a, an experience. And it, it just, it, took over my, my entire life. It was quite extraordinary. And so let's tell people about, I think many people know from here of the Marilla program because they know about San Francisco opera, but you were also an Adler sure. fellow. So describe that a little bit. Well, I was, um, you know, do you remember the, the, pro, the Watt tour, Western Opera Theater tour? Oh, yeah. yeah. So that sort of bridged the two and it, it was still in existence. And Butterfly was the show we took. And so here I am 22 singing Butterfly 72 times. But um, Marilla is the summer aspect of the program. And then there would be this like nine month Watt tour. It was broken into two parts where you travel the country on a bus and, you know, there would be four butterflies, you know, four Pinkertons and, and we'd switch off and, and have, um, you know, take turns doing the part, but doing quite, quite a prolific number of performances around the country. Bring, I mean, I sang Butterfly in a basketball, on a basketball court. I will never forget doing Un Bel and looking at the hoop, um, <laughs> the net or whatever it's called. <laughs> um, the, uh, but it, it, it was, it was, that was an important moment. And so I remember being rather ambitious and, and albeit naive, I went to, Christine Bullen, who was running the program at the time, and Patrick Summers, who was the music director. And I said, hey, I was on the bus. So how do I get one of these Adler things? <laughs> and, and they just laughed at me. And, you know, anyway, you're, you're appointed. And thankfully, I was appointed. And I, boy, what incredible training that was to, you know, boots on the ground for, to do yeah. that for 
for two years, and you know, my my first cover assignment was Alice in Falstaff with you know Pilar Loingar. The cast was Tom Stewart, Pilar Loingar, Marilyn Horn. I mean, it was it was it, Ruth Ann Swenson was the the Naneta. It was it was really an incredible experience, and the people that I had an opportunity to work with in that program, you know. Two weeks with Regine Crespin, Giorgio Tozzi, Hans Hotter, Elizabeth Soderstrom. I mean, it was it was kind of uh, amazing. I didn't know to be amazed then. Now, I retro retrospectively, I'm like, wow, um, you know, that's incredible. So uh, it it was it was a really unbelievably important and um, impactful experience. Wow, and so you clearly from then established a very close relationship with San Francisco Opera and have sung there many, many, many times. I know as I was looking for things to consider uh, to share with our people with us today, with the audience, you know, I was looking at some recent, a recent clip of you singing Susanna, the Carlo Floyd, which was not so long ago and was no, beautiful. It was, not. It was beautiful, it was beautiful, beautiful singing, beautiful production, but they gave you pretty wide berth to do a lot of things there, right? I did. I, I I've lost the. My, I can't remember the exact count um, of of roles I've done there. It's 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 huge. It's yeah. very. It's like either. I, I just. I'm sorry. I don't remember. And it was it was brought to my attention because they did after that. Susanna, one of my performances, they awarded me the opera medal there because you know that that's basically my artistic home. Yep. Um. And and you know I I got my start there and certainly. Uh, so many, many, many experiences and performance experiences. So yeah. Well, yeah, I want to share some video, place. and this is not San Francisco, but this is certainly, I knew of you as a student, and I'll tell you another funny story. I was in a production with Fort Worth Opera. You were an Adler fellow, you must have been. And I was singing in a production of Carmen, and the man who was my doing wig and makeup or something was on staff at San Francisco. And oh, he, really? said, he said, have you ever heard of this soprano, Patricia Rossette? I think she came from here. She's going to be the next, he said this, she's the next Tibaldi. And I was like, wow, that's like a big statement. But, you know, it was really nice to hear that after I'd just known you, like, know who you were as a student a couple of years before. So, right. at any rate, so this, <laughs> this, is, this is an early performance of you, I think, in your career, relatively early, in Santa Fe where you made a pretty big breakthrough in Emily, yeah. which is- 1996, it was, I had been at it for quite a while in my view, but it, it's the role that sort of opened the, the windows to the, yeah. to the professional world about, yeah. So huge national attention, world premiere, very impactful opera. For those of you who don't know it, it's an amazing work. Mm -hmm. I'm intending to bring it here at some point because I just think okay. it's so wonderful. And it actually, I won't, give away the story, but there is a, a moment in it dramatically that I've never been caught off guard in the way I was caught off guard by this. You know, you, you, the surprise really works in this opera. But this is an it's aria incredible. from the first act, I believe. And why don't we listen to this and you'll hear Patricia sort of at the beginning of her career.
It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yeah. It's a beautiful I, score. I, I, I've, I've almost forgotten <clears throat> such a beautiful score. It was a, an amazing process too, because it, I, I was st still quite young um, and, and just building Francesca Zambello's production and just building that character and, and sort of learning how to build in detail and nuance. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was more than just a breakthrough in terms of me and the profession. It was a breakthrough for me very personally and artistically. You know, um, your diction is so perfect in it. Like I, there's not a word that I didn't understand. And I, I've always been naturally, um, uh, adhered to a speech based technique. Yep. In fact, um, vocally, and, and because I, I feel like that is the best way, the best vehicle for, for uh, the sound to, to in the resonance to happen. So, I mean, yes, that was, it's something I still am really just adamant about both as, as a performer, but also as a teacher and stuff, because I, I feel like it's, 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 the, it's the gateway to good technique. So I'm gonna encourage our audience to um, just search online. The full performance is available free online there's it was a, it was shot for great performances and so mm -hmm. it's out there um and it's it's a remarkable work i'd like for you all as our audience members of san diego opera to know it because it's really really tremendous um all right so um let's talk about santa fe a little bit i believe you're sitting in santa fe right now are you i am i'm in i'm in my living room right now it's probably yeah. is it too bright back there are you guys okay it looks great it looks okay. professional yeah, fit. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's not. <laughs> God did it. Um, but um, yeah, I'm in. I'm at home in Santa Fe. I'm very grateful for it. In fact, we. I was in Monte Carlo singing, and in my view, got back just in time at the end of February before oh. things really started becoming, you know, shutting down and becoming nightmares. So we're very great, grateful to to be here and have the space we have. And and how long have you been in Santa Fe? Beth and I have lived here for 22 years. Wow. And yeah. you were probably drawn to it by singing at the opera, right? And Well, my debut was Emmeline in 1996, and I had never seen anything like that. I just was in love with it. I, I just, just, it was so different than New Hampshire or, or Denton, Texas. And I just, I really loved it. And then um, Beth, my, my wife, uh, was in the Apprentice program in 95. And then she was coming back to do um, 
some roles in 97 and I was singing Traviata and she was my Flora and we got together that summer and 23 years later we're we're here and we we found ourselves constantly wanting to come back here for little vacations or whatever so we realized you know in this profession you can live anywhere so, so as long as long as you can get to an airport reasonably and so why not live someplace that feeds your soul so yeah so you're mentioning Beth who was first seen as your bartender and you knew a drink <laughs> uh, but, but Beth Clayton is Pat's wife and also a very very beautiful distinguished singing actor, wonderful mezzo-soprano, had a very big career. I don't know if any of you have seen her, a wonderful performer, had the wonderful mm -hmm. opportunity to work with her in Gotham Chamber Opera in New York, and also to see her perform several times when I was living in New York. So you have mm -hmm. a very talented little household there. We do, and, and actually Beth has expanded her, her, her skills. She, she about a year and a half ago got her master's in clinical counseling and and now is uh she has quite a few clients as you can imagine right now in particular um and she deals with um she she focuses on being a counselor for for um performers she oh, wow. has other clients that are not at all in the music business but she has quite a few that are that are and is working with the young artist program in chicago the ryan center has worked with the young artists here has worked with, into houston and so she's 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 applying her performance and musical expertise to another, another, you know, uh, expertise. Aha. Oh, wow, we see the puppy. This, this is Zoe. Hi, this Zoe. Is Zoe. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for the nasal. Perhaps Zoe could but, join us. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. So you, um, um, anyway. you've sung several times in San Diego as well. So let's talk a little bit about your time in San Diego. I think I did a pretty exhaustive search. I hope I didn't miss anything. But I know you sang a Mimi here early on. Um, Katja Kabanova. Um, I'm going to mute it. It's all right. Katja Kabanova, Cold Sassy Tree, Butterfly, and then Diva on Detour. Did I miss anything as far as you can remember? No, Cold Sassy Tree, Diva on Detour. That was so fun, too, by the way. What yeah. a great venue. Um, Oh, no, I think you got it. Okay, yeah, good. I think, I think you got it. Well, let's, let's do another video because I want to make sure we're holding to our time frame. So let's, we have a brief video from your appearance here as Katja Kabanova. So let's do that. And of course, that's Janacek. We want to talk a little bit about how that feels for you because you're still singing this repertoire, which I think is fabulous. So uh, Joey, let's, um, let's watch this.
Pretty magical. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So you feel, do you feel an affinity for Janacek? Yes, I jokingly always said, I think I, I, I was a Czech maiden in a previous life or something. <laughs> I, I immediately, the very first time I sang Yanufa, which was, oof, gosh, I can't even remember the year. The, I remember working with Yvette Graf, who at the time was the person you go to for Czech diction. It, it, it just it just all fit. It made sense to me. It just felt comfortable. I mean, I use this expression a lot. It, it, the language felt comfortable in my mouth. Um, and what I particularly adore about Janáček is the fact that he writes in a way that the prosody of the language stays true. So mm -hmm. you, don't, you, don't, you don't have these, as, as in some styles and some composers, this sort of awkward extension of, of a sentence or of a phrase. You have an actual... Um, it actually, it, it, it is as it would be were you speaking it. And so I, I just, it, and just the, the, the sense of, of theater and drama that he, that he, he was able to unfold in all of his pieces are just, I just find him intoxicating and absolutely one of my super duper favorite composers to watch, hear, listen, sing, work on all of it. Yeah, I agree. I mean, every time I've seen an opera by Janicek, it's just, it's super, so engaging and I agree I think that the meter of the music feels so natural to the voice do you know what I mean it yes oh, yes it's when it's speech like it's speech like in the music when it's in it's an expansive more you know expansive moment whether it's emotional or theatrically or whatever it, it he accommodates that and it is completely wedded and integrated into its total theater his music is not separate from it yeah. and it's it's I I, I I just absolutely love, love, love it. Well, now we've loved having you here in San Diego, but clearly you've sung a few other places. So um, you've <laughs> had a pretty huge international career. I'll just try to throw out a few of the houses you've sung at. Um, Royal Opera House, La Scala, Paris Opera, Liceo in Barcelona, Teatro Real in Madrid. Bayerische Staatsoper, Canadian Opera Company, many, many others internationally. So a very big international career. And of course, many, many, many performances at this other opera house in this country called the Metropolitan Opera. So you've had a very big career there as well. Do you have any sense of um, how many roles you might have sung at the Met? Um, not off the top of my head, but I did. I was challenged by a singer, not challenged. This one singer was telling me about all the roles, all the performances she's done at the Met, and with all due respect, they were smaller roles and everything. So I thought, I was waiting in the airport one time, and I took out my calendar, took out my book, and I went and counted. I, I think my last count was 178 Good performances that I've that I've that I've sung there. And um, yeah, you know, when I think of that, I think I think, wow. Oh my God, I'm tired. Wow, that's been so. I mean, it's just such a myriad of, of response to to that experience because each one takes such, for, certainly for me, a total and complete um, investment. And so it's it's yeah, it's it's something. Where did all the time go? When you were at when you were at that point in your career where you were doing that much at the Met and huge, really singing at every major house and what. What was your life like? How much were you on the road? A lot. Yeah. Um, a whole lot. And you know, I, I, I get a question sometimes from people that aren't, aren't necessarily savvy about the opera biz. And, and so, you know, what's your schedule like? And I said, it's different. It's different every year. It's different every, every you know, every season. And the, the truth is um, there, was, there were times where we were home here in Santa Fe, maybe five days in total yeah. and and it just it just it was just you know one packing and unpacking moment after another and going to this place and um it, it it's intense one i have to admit that it, it i reached a certain saturation point at sure. a certain you know you know when you're because it's also your the responsibility of doing leading lady parts which is that's you know the 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 privilege and plight of my voice type and so it, it was a it was a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility, and I got I did get quite saturated at a certain point of you know after several decades of doing this and sure. and and you know wanted to sort of take a little take a little bit off of it. Have, and, have a little Santa Fe time, huh? Have a little Santa Fe time, and now you know obviously I'm I'm 
you know, I, I've, I've been home now longer than I've ever been um, since I lived with my parents in high school. So <laughs> this, is, this is a unique experience. Right. Um, and I, I have to say, for me personally, I'm a homebody, and um, it's, that's a slight silver lining. You know, yeah. we don't love that all of our engagements have been canceled or postponed or whatever it is, but that's a, that is a silver lining to be able to be home this much. You know, you you mentioned uh, we traveling. Um, one thing that I've tried to do when I can is to find opportunities to hire singers that are partners in a way, wives, husband, oh. wives, wives, spouses, uh, mm -hmm. in common productions, just to give you an opportunity to try to be in the same city as opposed to singing in different places. So, did you and Beth have much opportunities to sing together? No. We wow. sang Onyegin here in 2002. We sang Traviata in 1997. We sang, our repertoire didn't, didn't right. really cr cross over very much. And, you know, I mean, Puccini was not kind to, to the mezzo. So, and it's so much of my rep was in Puccini. And so, um, but we did sort of have a loose rule. No, you know, no more than, absolutely no more than six weeks apart. And there was one time where we went a little over that and it was, it was painful, honestly. Yeah. Um, uh, I really have always strived, and and I think to to a great degree succeeded at keeping a certain amount of balance in in my life. It's not just all about performing and 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 your artistic existence. It's also you know part of what you bring to the table as an artist oh. is how you live your life and who you know, what, what kind of experiences you have outside of the art form. That's part of what fuels your artistic um, creativity. And so that's been, that's, that, that for me has always been important. And also, you know, I, that's, that's what keeps me sane and balanced. Of course. Well, yeah. let's watch another video. We have one more and then we'll talk a little bit more and then we'll have a little. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll mute it because. Yeah. Zoe's chiming in. Yeah, Joey, Joey, Zoe, Zoe yeah, wants a, wants some t screen time. Sorry, well, yeah, I'm muting. Singer in the house, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's. We have a third video. We just talked about this other opera house called the Met that Pat's had a big career at, and one of her you know signature roles is Cho Cho San, Madame Butterfly. And let's see Unbaldi. I think this was from 2009. And this was a Met HD live performance. Uh, the beautiful production, many of you may know it, that still is in the Met's repertory. It's a great butterfly if you haven't seen it. It do is. This is actually the DVD capture. Oh, very good. Very good. Yeah. So let's yeah. watch this, Joey.
Brava, brava. Um, yeah, that's it's, it. The Rolf is like made for you. <laughs> well, I, I logged in probably 200 plus performances. I have not done a, I should sit down and just do a, a, a pedantic count of some of these questions you've asked me, but I've, I've experienced it a lot. And I have to say, uh, my, my favorite production is that production. Sorry. And, um, and you, you, I mean, it, it's, pro, it's proven because you actually, he, I believed in that production so much, he convinced me that it was okay to close on my own applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's such a beautiful filmic gesture and um, it's, it's just so, so, it's just, you know, it's such a, a beautiful experience to, to live that, that role. And I, I did it there, what, three times, three different times. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. But I, I mean, there have been really very few productions of Butterfly that I've thought, oh, God, this is just not working. And and um, no, it's it's such a beautiful journey for that character and story. Yeah. And you know, the, it, the music's pretty good too. Yeah. Well, but it's interesting to use the word journey because I was just thinking about that as I was watching you, and I was also thinking about the Emmeline clip that you know many of the roles in your repertoire, many operatic sopranos have to make this journey from innocence to tragedy. You know, through the course of an opera and the structure of Butterfly is perfect. It's just, you know, I think if you've seen the intent of what's in the score, it just reveals itself, right? It, yeah. It's such yeah. a beautiful, your performance of it is gorgeous. Yeah. Oh, thank you.
I'm sorry I didn't get to see you in uh, San Diego, but I still hear wonderful things about your butterfly here. Yeah, first. was it? Is it, it was Francesca Zambello's production, was it not? Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's a beautiful production too, albeit the consulate stuff in Act Two. But um, I, I actually don't. Uh, I, and don't get me wrong, I'm not at all a traditionalist in terms of my aesthetic about these things. But I, I mean, the you really have to work hard to screw up butterfly. To screw up butterfly and yenufa, you have to really want to do it because yeah. they just work. Right, <laughs> right. You have to really get in the way. You uh, have to really think, how am I gonna, how am I gonna mess this up? So let's talk about what today is like for you in your life. Let's say post COVID, because we're all in a different place now. But I know you're still singing. You still have an actor as a singer, but you've picked up some other things. So what kind of rep are you doing now? Very selective. Um, do you remember I referred earlier to, I've, I, I sort of reached a saturation point on a lot of levels, just the responsibility of leading lady and all the, uh, the amount of our um, iconic repertoire that I've logged hours and days and years in. I'm so grateful. I loved it, but I, I, I sort of am very project driven. Um, and, and so anything that catches my eye and I, I saw in the chats, Macropolis case is like way up there on my wish list. Oh, great. Of, of something I want to do big time. But the problem is a lot of the things on my wish list are absolute box office death. So <laughs> it's 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 a little it's a little tricky to to you know state those desires right now, right now in particular, but they, yeah. they remain there on my list. Um and uh I don't know if you all know, I mean I'm the artistic director of the Young Artist Program for Opera Theater St. Louis, which allows me to continue singing and allows me all the time for my other projects, but it allows me my other passion, which is fostering and curating um, young artists and working with them because I, I very much want to have an impact on the kind of artists you all get to see in the years to come and the, the sort of aesthetic um, integrity that I, that I believe needs to be there. And it's really, that's an exciting development and actually keeping me quite busy these days. Um, I, I also am directing, I made my directorial debut in 2018 at OTSL. I was supposed to direct Susanna um, mm -hmm. this past season, obviously it was canceled. Uh, I was supposed to direct a streetcar named Desire in Arizona, was canceled, or I, I, I'd prefer to think of it as postponed, um, as, as I've been told. But um, so I'm, I'm able to sort of um, I'm, I'm really, really content with my existence these days because I'm able to still live my life as a performer and also be on the other side of the curtain where I have so very much to say. Yep. And, and, and that, that has been an interesting and exciting, um, exciting uh, addition to my, you know, I've cast my net much wider and I'm happier for it, frankly, Good. because I've always had a lot to say about a lot of things and it, you know when you're when you're you know elizabetta when you're you know Chocho said, you're, it's not necessarily appropriate for you to be commenting on the whole story your, your job is very mono-minded it must be but i have always had opinions so now to find house those opinions in, in 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 a directorial sense or even in running a young artist program that's really satisfying and it brings other skill sets that i have um, that are not necessarily valued or, or needed in, in, as, as, as a leading lady. So that's, that's been, that's been good. I'm like a time management maniac. So, um, you know, you know, so I'm so organized. I'm so that, you know, it, it's just to, to be able to have that and to be able to have an understanding of what it is to be on both sides of the curtain is really incredibly valuable. I know that I, you know, people ask me if I miss singing and, I, of course, but um, I find myself more creatively satisfied in many ways running an opera company because sure. there's so many aspects of it that involve creativity. It's not just, you know, what you see on stage, it's managing people and it's dealing with the implications of artistic decisions on fundraising and, you know, it's, it's all of it winds up being creatively satisfying. So I can imagine you're feeling, you know, your gifts are wider in a way you know yeah it's nourishing and i have to say it's really um i i i salute you and appreciate how you handled um my valiant effort to insist that i was going to be okay to sing this thing because you were you were really understanding you really didn't 
if you felt stressed, you did not share it with me. And that's, that's always, that's so appreciated. And the fact is, you know, I, I don't care. I've sung a Met broadcast with 101 fever. If my voice works, I'm going to do it. Sure. You know, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. But the fact is this gave out, but you, you were very comforting. And I was, I was profoundly upset about that, but. Um, so my, my punchline was, and I thought of this on the way to the ball, I said, our diva's voice has taken a detour, but right. luckily we have a divo on deck. Because yeah, and I hear he did a great job. Hugh yeah. and Craig, they're like brothers to me. Yeah, and I'm seeing lots of thumbs up and I will pass that on yeah. certainly, but I'm, I'm so grateful. You know, when I woke up that, well, I think it was like a Thursday or something and I, oh God, oh no. <laughs> The first thing I did was call you. The second thing I did was call Craig. I said, do you, you still have that program that you're like, so I was trying to work out a, a, to, to leave the, the, the best options open for this. You know, I, I just, I feel such responsibility uh, for all the engagements, you know, um, and, and I feel such an adherence to, to what I've said I would do. And so that was, I was so relieved that he was there and able and, and so incredibly um, celebrated. So that, that, that's all good. But I was, I was really sad. <laughs> yeah, it worked out well for us. So no, no worries at all. And we'll definitely have you back. I actually do offline, we don't have to go through it now, but I clearly want to back in a variety of capacities. I definitely want you to direct for me. I do. I would love to. I, I have a I have a few ideas. I was going to bounce off of you as well. So we'll do Good. that. Après. We'll Après. have a whole time to talk to Yes. yes. <laughs> cool. Cool. All right. So I think we just have a couple of minutes left. I want to give you enough time to breathe before your next Zoom call. So let's. No worries. If has a question, please type it in chat. You can also tell Pat how much mm -hmm. you love her. Oh, we've got. <laughs> What advice do you have for a high schooler who's getting ready to apply to college voice programs? And what would you tell your high school self, knowing everything you know now? Great question. Um, the, very good question. Uh, high school, uh, now provided that this high school person knew they wanted to go into the operatic genre of, of, of music and everything, I would say, um, you know, choose, try and, 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 which I didn't do because as, as I told you, I didn't plan on doing this, but try and choose a teacher with whom you have some resonance and with, with whom you connect and, um, and have an idea of who you are and what you want musically and vocally. Have an idea. Even though I know you're young, I know you're, you're just starting out, but bring to the table something. Um, that is what, what, I would, what I would recommend. And um, you know, you also have to be as I had to be ready for the, for things to, you know, turn out in an entirely different way. So you just, you have to be open to it. I mean, that's a very in, incredible time from high school to college. You know, you, you think, you know, the best laid plans, isn't that the old adage? But just, just have as much of an idea about who and what you are, but you have to remain very open and flexible about what that is, because there's going to be a lot of incoming information. And I am a very strong proponent for people to, to, for young artists to take ownership over what they believe they are. But you have to stay, you have to stay malleable. Oh, I've I'll lost. go back to questions, but um, the point that you made about sort of knowing who someone is, even at an early age, that is the thing that when you're seeing auditions, there's a lot of good singers now, but the one thing that makes a really good butterfly mm -hmm. is the one that makes you sit up and go, it's someone that's showing who they are through it. Who they are. Yeah. I say this all the time, put your protoplasm in it, put yeah. you in it. We, we Look, I did a two week audition tour in my capacity at OTSL, and how many cardonomes did I hear? I was ready to jump off a bridge, but the fact is, the, so you you can't just simply deliver it politely and correctly. I don't want to hear correct singing. Yes, I do want to hear correct singing, but what I want to hear is you. And as an artist, it's incumbent upon you. It's your privilege. It's your responsibility. And you have got to offer your 
version of what that is. That's what an artist makes. Yep. And so uh, that's so, so very important. So we just had a comment that said, your acting is amazing along with the voice and that's why it works so well, which is very true. Thank I'm you. gonna let this wind down because I wanna give you a chance to breathe. No, I, I, can, I, can, I can be a tiny bit tardy. We're okay. okay I can well, be a tiny one, bit tardy. One other question. Can... There was a question about languages and that's sort of a nice general question that I think is fun to address, which is, do you wind up learning the languages you sing in? Very good question. Um, no, um, because the amount of um, task before you when you're preparing repertoire, pre preparing a role, I used to say, you know, basically you want at least nine to months to a year to really properly prepare a role. What you do, you get trained in the shortcuts. You're trained in the absolute diction so that you sound exactly um, like a native speaker of whatever that language is. What you do is you absolutely know everything you're saying and everything about the language that you possibly can know without fundamentally going through the, the rigors of learning the conjugations and whatever whatever's involved. Um, it, it's just, it's actually not, it, it's certainly in my experience possible to have, to have done that. You have some people that are just gifted or I'm sorry, but some of my European colleagues that are just they're there, they're around that, so they already come to the table with that. I sang so much Italian repertoire, and I did go to Italy and study um, in an intensive thing. The Adler Fellowship Program actually sent me there for um, six weeks to, to, to intensively study Italian because they knew that that's where my, the, the bread and butter of my, of my repertoire was gonna be, so I am functional in Italian. I should be far more functional in French than I am, but I am functional in French because I, I I'm, I'm French heritage, um, but like, so no, did I learn Czech? No, but did I know every single word I was saying that was being said to me? Absolutely. And, and, and I think those, those other, that's the realistic um, logistics of what it is to be, to be a performer, for sure. At, this is so wonderful. Thank you for taking time to be with us today. And uh, it's just, you know, it's good to let people get to know you a little better, you know, let our audience get Thank there. you. Thank yeah. you. It has been my pleasure. And I, I'm, I'm glad we could we could find a time to make this work, truly. Great. All right. Well, we're going to end this. So thank you very much. Give Beth my love and um, good to talk to you. Thanks very much.